Yukon. Before human beings, glaciers covered the mountains to the south and the lands to the east. As the climate changed, the ice melted. People occupied the land. Later, the ancestors of the Inuit crossed from Siberia into Alaska. Two thousand years ago, the First Nations people, the Athapascan, Kaska, Kuchin, Tlingit, and Tushoni settled here. And through these ages, the hunting of mammoth and bison gave way to caribou, moose, and sheep. By the mid-1700s, the first white man came. Vitus Bering, a Dane in the Russian Navy, reported an abundance of sea otters and other animals. His observations may well have been instrumental in the establishment of the fur trade. By the mid-1800s, the Hudson's Bay Company had established posts here. Twenty years later, in 1867, the United States purchased Alaska from Russia. Paralleling the growth of trade in the Yukon was the increasing influence of the missionaries. Men like Bishop Bompas of the Anglican Church spent much of their lives ministering to miners, traders, trappers, and native people. With the influx came a variety of social, cultural, and health concerns. Alcohol sparked many problems. The government responded by dispatching the Northwest Mounted Police, who were just in time for another event. In 1850, gold was reported by Hudson Bay explorer Robert Campbell. Twenty years later, prospectors began to drift into the Yukon. There was about a thousand people, I guess, in the area at the time, that is in the whole district, prospectors and miners and outfitters, all looking for gold. And Inspector Constantine uh, came up with about uh, 20 Mounties, and he was there because the um, government, Canadian government in Ottawa had received a lot of complaints from the area that the American miners on their side of the border in Alaska were um, applying their own form of law, including that part of Canada. And naturally our politicians got a little upset at that and uh, sent some Mounties to uh, put the place in order. And they arrived in 1894. August 16th, 1896. George Washington Carmack and two native companions, Skookum Jim and Tagish Charlie, struck gold on Bonanza Creek. Their find was more than partly due to the advice of Robert Henderson, whom they gave neither monetary nor other recognition. For the record, his name does appear on this cairn erected long after he passed away. The routes to the Klondike gold fields were many and varied. Perhaps the worst was through Edmonton via what became Watson Lake. The southern gateway to the territory, it's the first community north of the 60th parallel at mile 632, or kilometer 1016.8. In the spring of 98, a young man from Yorkshire, England, Frank Watson, arrived. After traveling over a thousand miles of uncharted territory, he stopped for a rest. And that was it. He never took another step toward the still distant Klondike. Cutting a long story short, he married a local native lady, Adela Stone, built a home, raised a family, and lived happily ever after. For the next 50 years, Watson Lake remained a quiet, tranquil spot, until one day in February 1942, President Roosevelt had declared that a pioneer road, later named the Alaska Highway, should be built. So one day we were sitting there and we heard a cat down the valley. It was a lead cat. And it was just dinner time, it was quarter to twelve. So when we had our dinner, I went up the hill there, and I got to the top of the hill and I listened for the cat, and I couldn't even hear him. He was gone past us for three or four miles. In 1992, the 50th anniversary of the highway project, a year-long extravaganza was held along much of the 1,500-mile route. 
One of the first to commemorate the event was a team of snowmobile enthusiasts who made the journey from Dawson Creek to Fairbanks and return. Some did it the hard way. And some hitched a ride when forced to do so. And for those who find the pace a little fast, one can always try a more traditional form of Yukon transportation, dog mushing. They're, they're bred to, uh, to run and have been for probably three or 4,000 years. And uh, you just keep passing those genes down and I very seldom have a problem breaking the pup to, to harness, they just wanna go. One of the things that that people don't realize is that all these people live up in the north here they don't vacation here in the summer most of us work seasonal jobs our vacation time is in the winter so we have to turn our vacation fun time into winter sports and this is probably one of the fastest growing and most rewarding uh, of all the winter endeavors Later, a convoy of authentic World War II vehicles checked out what was once dubbed Uncle Sam's Warpath, the road to nowhere. For most of the time, it was full speed ahead, until reaching the Canal Turnoff. Here, amongst the trees and overgrowth, a collector's heaven. A wrecking yard full of treasures. Vehicles that never returned from the rigors of war. Spare parts galore, just waiting to be saved. One enthusiast came all the way from Chicago on his treasured Harley. It's a hobby, and uh, I, I think I probably uh, have maintained it the way it has for a lot to represent the GIs that. Uh, that used the bike because some of them fellas were like 20 years old now or 70 plus and uh, quite frequently they'll come around and they'll say wow I remember that so and so so uh, part of the bike is for them surely you know. and then uh, of course my children are interested in the bike when I uh, go to the land of retirement <clears throat> I expect that'll be about 40 more years from now The gold stampeders who took the more popular route through Skagway or Dai and over the Chilkoot or White Pass entered the Yukon through Caribou Crossing, later named Carcross. A picturesque village in which the railroad depot, a general store, and a hotel take center stage. The town's greatest moment may well have been the festivities associated with the arrival of the White Pass and Yukon Railway. The ceremony of the last spike was celebrated here on July 29, 1900. The 110-mile line from Skagway, Alaska to Whitehorse, Yukon had been completed. This was the big day. And perhaps if the bar hadn't been open, it would have been more noteworthy. As it was, some of the dignitaries spent a little too long imbibing before facing the spike. Brandishing their mauls, they found the spike bent all too easily. For the next 80 years, the railroad ran with hardly a hitch. It weathered the boom and bust of the Yukon economy until 1982, when a slump in base metal prices brought mining to its knees 
and with it the White Pass. Six years later, like the proverbial Phoenix, it was up and running again. Operating a summer excursion service, it now carries record numbers of passengers. Many are tourists, cruise ship passengers, and railroad bugs. At the present time, only the southernmost 40 miles of track are in service. Reinstatement of service to Carcross is eagerly awaited. Hopefully, it won't be too long before the mountains echo once more to the whistle of number 73. Whether stampeder, visitor, or resident, the next stop in the Yukon is likely to be the capital, Whitehorse. With a population of some 20,000, it's the largest center in the territory. Named after the White Horses of the Rapids, through which the Stampeders had to pass on their journey to Dawson, it's justifiably described as the city of the future with the golden past. When the railway arrived, it was a tent town named Closely. The major stockholders were the Close Brothers. Later, the government announced the town site would be called Whitehorse. Regardless of its name, it remained a company town. Here, the White Pass River Division, British Yukon Navigation, was formed in 1900 and ran more than 20 sternwheelers. Traveling between Whitehorse and Dawson, they offered every amenity. The construction of all-weather roads and the advent of air service ended the sternwheeler supremacy. Today, two remain. One, the Klondike Two, has been preserved by the Canadian Park Service on the banks of the Yukon River. The Klondike Two was built in 1937, following the loss of the Klondike One, which came to an abrupt end in 1936, when she ran aground. From 37 through to 52, the Klondike was employed primarily as a cargo vessel, carrying general merchandise and a few passengers. The run from Whitehorse to Dawson, 461 miles, could be completed in under 36 hours, including stops to pick up cordwood to fire the boilers. In 1950, the opening of an all-weather road saw the loss of her freight hull. This, plus the restricted period during which the river is navigable, prompted British Yukon navigation to refit her as a cruise ship. Regrettably, the plan was 20 years ahead of its time, too early to capitalize on what would become a burgeoning tourist trade. With a farewell blast from her whistle, she completed her last voyage in 1955. Beautifully restored to her 1937-1940 period, she is now a national historic site. While the railway and riverboats played a major role in Yukon transportation, aviation also played a part in opening up the north. In 1920, the U.S. Army took an initiative to uh, uh, they had some airplanes and they were anxious to prove the value of the airplane, the versatility and usefulness of, an, of the airplane. And they undertook to plan an expedition from New York to Nome, Alaska with four de Havilland DH-4 aircraft. These were large biplanes uh, that had been designed and used as bombers uh, during World War I. They had a huge 400-horse liquid-cooled Liberty engine in the, uh, in the front of them and, and uh, had proved to be rugged, reliable airplanes. So they set out in, uh, in the summer of 1920 from New York and set course across uh, the continent um, and came up through, uh, I think they came through Saskatoon and uh, through Edmonton and across to Prince George and, and over to the coast and up through Wrangell and and uh, uh, arrived in Whitehorse. Most places they went to, uh, of course, would, would have had no airport until just prior to their arrival. They'd have uh, made a strip uh, somewhere to accommodate the airplanes. That was the case with Whitehorse. There was no airport here until the plans were being set for this flight, and then the airport, uh, 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 an area was cleared out large enough up on the escarpment to 
accommodate these airplanes. Eventually, anyway, all four of them made it uh, through Dawson and through Fairbanks right on into Nome, Alaska, and all the way back to New York. All four airplanes. And uh, an incredible feat. You know, we all recognize the incredible feat of Lindbergh flying his single-engine airplane across the Atlantic. But the risk was every bit as great flying those single-engine airplanes across the vast wilderness of, of uh, North America, and particularly uh, the northern parts of North America. I mean, if any of them had, had had an engine failure in flight, the others, all they would be able to do is wave goodbye and there wouldn't be anything else they could do. And they could have gone down into the wilderness hundreds of miles from any assistance of any kind. In 1927, the Queen of the Yukon was based here a sister aircraft to Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis. In 1992, Whitehorse was host to a major air display celebrating the Alaska Highway 50th anniversary. As a major player in the Northwest staging route, the airport was one of a chain of facilities which saw the successful shipment of some 8,000 aircraft to Russia, a World War II ally who desperately needed fighter aircraft. The air show featured aircraft spanning the last 50 years and pilots from both Canada and the United States. Downtown Whitehorse is a contrast of the old and the new. Many buildings recall the days of 98. The Bank of Commerce, where Robert Service worked, is a part of the Central Core. Although the building is not the one service worked in, several artifacts from his time are proudly displayed. Service wrote some of his most famous verse while working in Whitehorse. In a compilation, Songs of a Sourdough, lines like, A bunch of the boys were whooping it up, from the shooting of Dan McGrew, and There are strange things done in the midnight sun, from the cremation of Sam McGee, jump right out. His imagination came alive as he walked the gold rush trails around Miles Canyon. For six hours I tramped those silver glades and when I rolled happily into bed my ballad was cinched. Next day with scarcely any effort of memory I put it on paper. My moonlight improvisation was secure and although I didn't know it McGee was the keystone to my success. From literary artists of the past to distinguished painters of the present, Whitehorse has its fair share. Artist Ted Harrison, like Service, was born in England, found his inspiration in the Yukon, and has developed a strong following both here and abroad. We heard of a show, one of Ted's shows in Calgary about a year ago, and we got a call at 10 o'clock in the morning from this woman who said, you know, I'm really not prepared. Uh, you, I understand you have Ted Harrison. He lives there in Whitehorse. And we said, yes. Well, she wasn't prepared to stand all night long, or at least half the night, she said, just to buy an original. Now, you must have some on the wall, so why don't I just fly up and I'll get one. Can you describe to me what you have on your wall? And my only reaction would be, well, I wish we did have some. But we didn't. <laughs> So I said, you better line up or else we can put you on our mailing list and you can come to our next show. With increasing success, the demands for one's paintings becomes very great and the pressure from galleries becomes great in consequence because naturally when your works are selling, the galleries want an exhibition, you see. Well, my attitude to that is um, I don't mind making a living from painting. It's rather nice to make a living from painting, but I don't want to become the slave of materialism in a sense that the more one paints, the more money one earns. 
but the thing is also that you're liable to become a slave to um, painting painting for money's sake which is the worst possible reason to paint uh, and then you'd lose your enjoyment of it I like to sit down the ease and I like to feel I'm enjoying painting well, he's a very established Canadian uh, artist and should a gallery acquire his prints, his seriographs, uh, and possibly his originals, which of course in great demand, then they have achieved a prize. Now for an artist though, even a living artist, he can only produce so many works. And so really he can only go to so many galleries. So he has one. I wouldn't uh, say that in every major center, but in Vancouver and in uh, Calgary and Ottawa, but four or five in Canada, I believe, do have his original works, and they do vie for original shows. But of course, this artist can only produce so many original shows. <laughs> We're hoping for another one in about a year, year and a half. In 1950, the Yukon Historical Society was formed by W.D. McBride, after whom the museum is named. Joanne Meehan is the curator. Bill McBride was a very good historian and really functioned as the curator of the museum for many years until he left the territory in the early 60s. And people like Bill McBride, who was a longtime resident and employee of White Pass, could see that the history of the Yukon was disappearing out of the territory. Independent travel by visitors made it possible uh, for things to go out of the territory, and also some of the old timers who had been involved in the gold rush were gone. So he, with uh, a number of other important people in the community, like George and Martha Black, uh, were founding members of this museum. A um, large part of our collection relates to White Pass, and White Pass was integral to the history of uh, White Horse, and uh, he was responsible for collecting many artifacts. Uh, among them is the steam locomotive, number 51. And that locomotive was one of the first two brought north of 60 and actually was involved in constructing the White Pass from 1898 to 1900. It's a very important artifact and its sister locomotive is in Skagway. The collection in this museum is actually very broad. It includes Yukon cultural and natural history and part of that is because the First Nations culture here is completely integrated with the natural landscape. So you'll find many different kinds of uh, exhibits here, including First Nations. And one of the galleries that is most popular in this museum is this Natural History Gallery. And Brenda Carson is our heritage programmer. And she has uh, here today some of the things that we uh, involve our visitors in when they come to the museum. The lynx, which is a member of the cat family, is very much a carnivore, which you can tell from the sharp teeth both in front and on the back. And of course, that differs from the thin horned sheep, which is a herbivore, a plant eater, which has the large flat teeth. And of course, bears eat both plants and meat. And uh, you can see the flat teeth and, and, and sharp ones in front, very much like our own. We have two examples of Yukon wolves, and, and they do also have different color variations. Here you see you know, black and then the lighter gray ones. And behind them are the three examples of the different red fox that, that you would find in Yukon. Um, again, three different color variations. We have lots of coyotes, and they're you know, fairly common to see along roadsides. And we have a young black bear. Um, again, in, in terms of the bear species, that's the one you're more likely to see when you're driving down the highways in Yukon. Grizzly bears are found th throughout the Yukon. This one happens to be a, is a particularly large one um, in Yukon. Um, the grizzly bears tend to be a little smaller than in other jurisdictions. Um, again, mostly because of food availability. On the Alaska Highway, en route from Whitehorse to Fairbanks, lies spectacular Klawani National Park. Further along the highway, on the outskirts of the park, lies the ghost town of Silver City. Although the life of Silver City was short-lived, for a while, it boasted a Northwest Mounted Police post and a post office. High freight rates to Whitehorse and low yields sealed its fate, and it was abandoned. Now, it's home to a host of Arctic ground squirrels, known locally as gophers. In the fickle world of gold mining, it's interesting to note that on July 9, 1987, Canada's largest gold nugget was found on the southern outskirts of Kluwani. 
On a property belonging to Heinz Eckervold, located on the B.C. Yukon border, Alan Dendy's picked up this find of a lifetime. Weighing 2,300 grams, or 74 and one-half troy ounces, it was valued in excess of $100,000. For the Stampeders who had successfully climbed the passes, the natural route to Dawson was via the Yukon River. And the only affordable vessel in which to make the journey was one of their own construction. In the spring of 98, the Mounties counted over 7,000 assorted craft en route. For the main part, the river was clear sailing. Dawson City at the confluence of the Yukon and Klondike rivers was home to some 30,000 people in 1897. Today, much of the real wealth of yesteryear, the artifacts, mining records, etc., are safely under the care of the Dawson City Museum and Historical Society. Located on Fifth Avenue at Church Street in the recently reconstructed Territorial Administration Building, this is a must-see attraction. Heather Smith is the museum director. One of the group of artifacts that I'm particularly interested in um, that we have in this collection are all the things that are made from something else. It, was a, it took a lot of effort and energy to bring anything this far. Once you got it here, you didn't, you didn't throw it away if you didn't need it anymore. You made it into something else. This is a miner's cabin and it shows a lot of contrast. It shows on the one hand a remnants of another life. There's photographs, there's things that might, have, might um, appear to be out of place here. They wouldn't be in a little cabin out in the creeks. They'd be in a city house. Well, maybe this person came from a city house and this is where they live now. And you can get a sense of that by looking at the things that, that are in this little room. Also, how little it is, how tight this was. Imagine when it's 40 below for two months and this is where you live. That's a <laughs> pretty, pretty uh, small space and, um, and that would, it would be dark. And, and, uh, and then, as soon as it starts to get warm, what you do is you'd go outside and you'd build a fire and you try to melt that permafrost so you can get down to where the gold is. So just try to imagine that life, that dirty, mucky, cold, hard life. The, uh, in the resource room we've put together, we call it the photo finding aid, and what it is is it's um, um, a 4x5 photographic copy of a uh, large part of our photo collection, and, um, and those photographs you can flip through and you can read the information below the photograph, that anything we know about it. And, uh, and these photographs are, are incredible. They're, they're, they seem so, it seems so close and real, and when you go outside the museum and you look around town, you can see the same landscape out behind the, that you just saw in a photograph. And, Particularly interesting for me is looking at the people in those photographs. A lot of the people look around my age. It just really stretches my imagination to imagine what it would have been like for them to have come all of this way. Um, for most of them, never have even seen gold or the creeks <laughs> and, uh, and, and how hard that life must have been. But then, uh, um, only you know, four or five years later, they were building a building like this one. They were building the old territorial administration building. So the contrast from being a, a rough, little cabin out on the creeks to, to this kind of grandeur in, in government building is quite, quite amazing. The Klondike Mines Railway operated from 1906 until 1914, serving the camps and communities along the creeks of the Klondike. Many of the old locomotives are housed in the adjacent train shelter. While restoration is a massive undertaking, the work has already begun. Engine number four was the first. Restored for display at Expo 86 in Vancouver, she serves as an example of what can be accomplished. For those not inclined to hard work, but with a lust for gold and a strong arm, diamond tooth girties might fill the bill. Until recently, this was the only legalized gambling establishment in Canada. If you hanker after quieter pursuits, the cabins of Jack London and Robert Service are open daily throughout the summer. I wanted the gold, and I got it. Came out with a fortune last fall. Yet, somehow, life's not what I thought it. And somehow, the gold isn't all. 